Pshat in Asof. There's a famous rule, Shein Sachar Va'onish Ba'olam Hazeh, there's no reward and punishment for one's deeds in this world. If there were, one's free will would be limited. Right? Hashem does not want to interfere with one's free will, and he therefore does not reward or punish after any specific deed. And he allows an individual to believe that either things are a coincidence or there is, but that there's no divine intervention. That is usually the case, unless we're dealing with Am Yisrael as a whole, the Jewish nation as a whole. But Shabbat Kotai discusses what will happen to the Jewish nation as a whole, as a group, not as individuals, if they follow the Torah Misfot or if they do not follow the Misfot. The same is true with Pashat Kitavo. There are consequences. And the reason why there are consequences for the group as a whole is because we need to know if we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. As a group, it's very important. As individuals, however, Hashem does not want to interfere with the free will, and only occasionally He will send messages or hints that we're not doing things properly. But that's all they are, is messages. The actual sechara and the onus, the reward and the punishment for one's deed, for the mitzvot that he performed, is reserved for the olam abba. And there are many explanations, other than the one I just gave you, not to interfere with the free will. Another explanation is because the reward is so great and immense, it's not possible to pay us back. Even if a Jew put on tefillin one day, the day he became a mitzvah, never, after that never did. For that one day of putting on tefillin, the, the reward is so immense, Hashem cannot give us the reward for it because it's a different kind of currency, the currency of, of payment of, for the mitzvot. In any event, parshat, in Barshat so we find something very unusual. It is the only one, perhaps the only one mitzvah in the Torah, that an individual is able to see divine intervention. And that is the parashat dealing with sota a woman who betrays her husband and goes out and has an affair with another man, a married woman. So we're going to talk about that in the, because that is a very important part of Parshat Maso. In the beginning, the Torah says, "Vedaber Hashem Moshe lemor, daber el bnei Yisrael ve'amarta lehem ish ish kitiste ishto u'maala bo maala." A man, a man. It says ish ish. It's a, it's a repetitive language, and we all know that in the Torah there is no extra word. There's no extra letter. Every word is there for a reason. There's an emphasis here. It says, Ish, Ish. Why does it say Ish, Ish? Because when a woman betrays her husband, she's not only betraying the trust of her husband, she's also betraying the trust with Hashem. So it's a double betrayal here. Ish, Ish. Remember, when a woman betrays the man, she's not only betraying her man, she's betraying also the relationship that she has with Hashem. The are mitzvot that when one transgresses them, it's, uh, it does harm perhaps to his fellow Jew, right? It's ben Adam l'chaveror. The are mitzvot if one transgresses them, he's affecting the relationship between him and the Almighty. If he does not put on tzitzit one day in the morning, does that affect his neighbor or his friend? No. So there are mitzvot ben Adam l'chaveror ben mitzvot ben Adam l'makom. There are certain situations, however, where the two are affected, right? When one desecrates the name of Hashem in public, he could be doing something against Hashem, and he could be also doing something against an individual, like shaming someone in public. He could be a Hilul Hashem, he could be a Albanat Bnei Haver Barabim. So there are situations where one can be affecting the two, another Jew, and also his relationship with Borei Olam. This is, not, this is no small matter. Parashat Sota is a very, very important parasha in the Torah. Uh, there's a lot going on over here, and we need to understand the psychology a little bit of why, of why these things happen. After all, the two were in love at one time. They, they went on a honeymoon, perhaps. They were engaged for several months. Perhaps they were even sweethearts from the, when they were children. Nevertheless, these things happen. So we need to understand the psychology of why is this happening. But before we get to that, the Torah reminds us that this is serious. This is a betrayal against the husband and against Boreh Olam. Because this is so serious, we're going to see what the consequences are. So how does all this happen? So the rabbis explain several points. That first of all, you should know that in order to go against the Almighty, in order for a human being, flesh and blood, and blood, a mortal being who knows that there is a creator, who's convinced that there's somebody watching him, in order for him to rebel, it can only happen in the Savoru Ashtut. And one cannot sin, a human being, who knows about God. We're talking about one who's, who has at least some knowledge. 
that he's going to have to pay for it, for for his act for his action. How could he ever think of sinning, or of transgressing a, a an avera? It's only because for a moment, a moment earlier before he committed the sin, there was a ruach shtut. A ruach shtut means a spirit of folly. You know, all of you know what folly is, right? He was crazy for a moment. Does that sound familiar? Where do we see that today in the course? Insanity. Perfect. They want to use it for everything. For everything. At the moment he killed her, he was insane. He went crazy. You know what? There's some truth to that. <laughs> Why is there some truth to that? I mean, he's going to end up in jail anyway if he's found guilty. Why is there some truth to that? Because what's a, what's the a spirit of folly? What's a Ruach Tut? A Ruach Tut tells that an individual thinks himself what? What every thief and every criminal thinks. Anybody know what that is? I'm going to get away with it. <laughs> Ruach Tut. Right? If you don't, if you know for sure you're gonna get caught, you're gonna do it. Well, you have to wait. Well, let me see. I'm gonna be 25 years in jail, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm being asked right now to transfer some drugs from Mexico to the United States for a hundred thousand dollars permission. But I'm gonna be sitting 25. Is it worth it? Let me ask you. Is a hundred thousand dollars worth it? Let's say you can. Let's say you can get. You get to keep the money. Even. Forget about the chance, the possibilities that you're not gonna get the money either. Right? Is it worth it? 25 years in jail. For hundred thousand dollars, I don't think so. I think everybody prefers their liberty, right, over being in jail. But for a moment, there's a ruach stud that tells him, "I'm going to get away with it." That's the, well, that's the typical ruach stud. There's other studios too, but this is a typical spirit of folly. Nobody's nobody's going to see me doing it. The same is true when you're on the freeway. You're going to the desert, going on a freeway where you think that there's no cops watching you and you're going to go 95 miles an hour, right? You want to get there fast. But if you knew that behind you is a highway patrol, you can see him. Would you go? No, I don't think so, because you don't want to use your driver's license. You don't want to get a hefty penalty, right? You don't want to go through the courts and get points and insurance hikes, right? You don't want to. You want to avoid that, even if you're in a hurry, right? What's the you know? So you. So it takes you a little bit longer, but you think you get away with it. So a woman who is nisted at the way it began is that she was talking to this man, and her husband suspected her. Nothing ever happened necessarily right we, I'm, I'm already over the hill I already told you that she committed a sin but let's go back a few steps she did not necessarily do anything wrong but she did do something that was not too healthy Nistera in Gever in other words she was in a place in a private room with this man and her husband saw it several times and he warned her next time I see you I'm going to take you to the Kohen Gadol and we're going to we're going to take you through a process that a woman who is a Sota goes through because I suspect if you were in a private closed room and you were long enough there for an avera for a sin to be committed, perhaps it was committed. I don't know. We're only human. And these things happen all the time. Ever since Adam Arishon, the area of, of immorality, the area of adultery, all these similar things. Look what's going on in the Catholic Church today. It's nothing new. Just they're discovering it now. But it all, if it's now, it always existed. Perhaps even more. Right? And now they're discovering, but it always existed. So the Torah is aware that these things happen. We're all humans. We're not necessarily any better or any stronger than the non-Jewish uh, world. But we have a Torah that hopefully if we follow it, if we study it, will give us the strength to combat the Yetzirah, the evil instinct that is always trying to, you know, get us off the right track. And this one particular area is a very difficult area to deal with once you've fallen into the trap. As long as you maintain a distance, what do they tell you when you're driving? You know, figure it out. 10 miles, if you're traveling 10 miles an hour, one car. Every 10 miles multiplied, right? What? One car lane. One car lane for every 10 miles per hour. In other words, if you're traveling 60 miles an hour, maintain a distance of six cars, because they figured out more or less calculated that that's how long it will take you to stop and not crash into the next vehicle at a high speed. Maintaining a distance is therefore something very important. Everybody agrees with that. And the same thing with Mitzvot and Averot. The rabbis tell us that we need to have siyagim. Even though we have 613 commandments, you ha we need to have fences to prevent us from falling in. When you go to a major construction site, you will definitely see signs. Beyond this point, hard hats. Right? They don't want to. They don't want to be sued. In some places, when you go to fix your car, they tell you our insurance does not cover beyond this point. So please don't enter the work area. Right? You have to maintain a distance because anything can happen. Shalom, anything can happen, and uh, we need to be cautious about it. We look, we can't take a chance. 
nobody could say, especially in the area of Arayot, it won't happen to me. Because the rabbis tell us that unfortunately, many people, with Shalim, fall into the trap of Arayot. Even the greatest Sadiqim, the greatest sages. There's no guarantor. Nobody can say it's not going to happen to me. Arayot is the areas of, uh, uh, in English it would be, uh, I guess, translated Im- immorality, adultery, fornication, right? Anything that has to do with Arayot. The word Arayot itself are all the prohibited relationships. That's the word Arayot, the prohibited relationships in the Torah. And one of the prohibitions that is not written in the Torah, but was instituted by the rabbis in order to protect us for our own good. They're not adding commandments, they're simply protecting the commandments. They're putting a fence around it. Arayot. Arayot. Keep a distance. Dirbala. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you never know. If you're in the same room with a woman and she's a Miss Universe, even if it was Miss Universe three years ago, she's still beautiful, <laughs> right? In three years, she, she'll, she'll still be beautiful, right? Maybe 25 years later, maybe not so. But you're right. You might be tempted to do something. And if you're not, and, and if you're not tempted, she might tempt you, right? I think you mean she's ugly, and you are not there. All right, that could happen too. <laughs> not, not, not for everybody, right? Anyway, so in this particular area, the Torah says, don't take any chances. So the rabbis put all sorts of darim. And we have many darim. One of the darim is called Yehud. There are several halachot that a man with a married woman, and even with a single woman, right, cannot be in a closed room, especially at night, unless the door is unlocked and it's facing the outside street. It's a married woman, unless her husband is in town, and she, he can come at any moment. So she doesn't want to be surprised, right? Yeah, the key. Or if she has her daughter with her, a daughter who's old enough age that she would be embarrassed to do something in front of her daughter, right? Man with a woman, women with men. You know, there are various rules as to how one may be with a woman, depending on who this woman is. She said, I mean, of course, your own daughter, your own mother, your sister, and even your sister, you know, after a certain age, you have to be careful not to spend too much time and not to share the same apartment for an extended period of time. That's called Yehud. Yehud, in other words, when the two man and woman are together, it, breeds, it can breed problems. So the Torah tells us that the w- reason why this is beginning to happen, this problem th- in this relationship between the uh, husband and his wife, is because at one point the woman was not Noah. At one, at one time the woman was not modest. She did something which was not modest. What do you mean about this? Sota. Sota. We're talking about Sota. The way it happened was because at one time this woman was not modest. Okay? And as a result of her lack of modesty, she had an affair perhaps with this individual. We don't know yet, right? The husband doesn't know yet, but he warned her, and she didn't heed his warning. He saw her talking to this man, and she suspects her. Well, why is she talking to him so close? Why so affectionately? Why, yes, why, why in a private room, why not outside? Doesn't look right. He, he's, he's entitled to suspect, okay? He's entitled to suspect, right, that something is wrong here. So what is happening? She had a Ruach Shtut at one point, or he had a Ruach Shtut, this, this other man, not the husband. And this Ruach Shtut, this, this spirit of folly, led them to this private room, right? And had she been modest, modesty means either dress properly or not talk to men in general or outside, as they say in English, there's a word for it, uh, not to... Uh, you know, how do you say when, when a man and woman are... No, 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 they're not talking, they are flirting, flirting, right, flirt. If she would be modest, it would not have come to this point where she's flirting. And that's what this is, maybe, unless it's very possible, we don't know. She has an important message to this man, for this person to say. That's also a possibility. But this would not have been the case here, because this is already the second or third time. Her husband has already warned her. So if it's a one-time thing, it could be. But after it's two, three times, you, we, we all begin to suspect. So what do we have here? We have a ruach of shtut. If there was a sin that allowed them to come together and do something wrong, and this could only have happened as a result of her lack of modesty, which was one of those fences I was talking about. If she would be modest, she would dress properly, the men would probably not look at her. What about all these women who dress provocatively? What do you think that does to the men? Right? Right? Oh, whether well, it's a purpose or not, it's, it's provocative, and that is, it brings about a mirshol. If she would be snua, perhaps if she wouldn't go outside on her own. Uh, what happened to Dina? She went out. She was curious, and Shem got to her and raped her. Right. So if a woman is, is is modest, if she's careful, she just doesn't talk to any man. Right. She's uh, avoiding trouble. 
obviously here, this was not avoided, and that is why we have a problem here. A husband suspects that his wife betrays him. So what is he supposed to do? Yeah, all right, yeah. So what is he supposed to do? So the Torah gives us the procedures that he goes to the Kohen Gadol, brings a sacrifice, and they make her drink some waters. This is a very special potion of water. These are bitter waters because the Kohen would put into the water uh, some of the earth in the bed of, from underneath the Bet Amitash, there was a particular spot there where he would raise one of the stones, one of, a marble, a square, he would pick it up, and uh, he would take a little bit of the dirt from that spot and put it into the, into the water. And he would also throw in the name of Hashem. The name of Hashem, which you're not allowed to erase, it's a holy name. In this case, it was allowed to be erased for the sake of making peace between the two. Because after the woman would be given this to drink, if she in fact did not sin, we're going to soon see, she was blessed. Blessed means what? If she never had children, she would have a child. If she always had children, the children that she would have from now on would be boys, and it would be a very easy childbirth. She would be blessed, because she was suspected wrongly. If, however, Hazrat she did commit a sin, this would be a terrible punishment. Her stomach would swell, and so were her legs and thighs, and she would die in a few minutes. And it would be a horrible, painful death. Now, the Gemara does say that not all women would die right away. There are some women who had zechuyot, who made, did many mitzvot, and some very powerful mitzvot that have merits. It's like you have credit, you know, and they would have credit. And the credit prevents their premature death. The death would come about maybe for two years or three years down the road. So we would not know. So these would be the only exceptions that we would not know whether they sinned or not. This was a test, right? We want to determine. She says she, she denies the whole thing. Why most women deny everything. Yeah. They deny everything. But she goes, he goes back, she goes back to the husband for two years. He doesn't have to deal with her. He's got to see she's okay. You know, you know what I think? But eventually it's going to get to her. It's going to catch up with her. Right? It's going to catch up with her eventually. That is the exception. The rule is, is for the most part, this would examine her. The waters would enter inside, and she would explode, basically. She would die in front of everybody else. She would go through a lot of bushot. She would go through a lot of embarrassment and shame, because one of the first things the Kohen would do is remove her head covering. This is where the rabbis tell us that the Torah reveals that a married woman has to have her hair covered. Otherwise, why is he uncovering her hair? Why should her hair be covered? Because a married woman had her hair always covered, Back then, in the whole entire Middle East, not only Jews, but even Taliban, <laughs> everybody, they were very modest. You didn't have to wear a burqa like they do, covering everything from head to toe. But the head was covered, the hair, the hair for a married woman it needs to be covered. No, 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 I said covered. Right. It was covered. They were modest. They covered their, their arms, their, their legs, right? Look what's going on today. I mean, they're, they're just wearing a few strings, barely. And if, and if they're wearing normal clothing, it's very, very tight on their body. You know, so you should see everything, right? And transparent. That too, right? So anyway, so there's a, there's a tremendous lack of modesty in the generation before Mashiach. What can we do? But anyway, in those days, when we still had a Bet HaMikdash and we had a Kohen Gadol, at, at least at one, at, at one, point, at one time, not, not later on, because later on we stopped doing this. I'll tell you why soon. But up until a certain time, they needed to examine the woman. They needed to know, should they continue to be together as a married couple? Is it just suspicion? Even though she did the wrong thing, but maybe nothing happened. This was the only way to check it out. And if, in fact, she was clean, everything worked out for the best. If not, it was a big Kedush Hashem. God's name was sanctified. And if they were able to see, they were able to see in this one instance that there is Dayan, there is a judge upstairs. They saw it in front of them right away. This is no laughing matter. By the way, besides Sota, there are other situations where there's Din Min Hashemayim, where there's judgment from him, a few others. What they all have in common is that there are no witnesses. Because what would happen if there were witnesses here, that they saw her doing something wrong, or him doing something wrong? There would be a death penalty if there was warning, if there was witnesses. So the issue here is a lack of witnesses. There's only one witness who saw them enter the room, of course. That there is. How does the husband ever find out? Right? Somebody saw him and let him know that. And we can rely on that at least to bring about this procedure, this interrogation. And during this interrogation, the Kohen Gadol would warn her and would try to encourage her to admit the truth. 
let's not erase the name of Hashem for the sake of peace. Reveal the, tell us the truth. Right? If she would deny everything, you know, we would, then we would not give her to drink, to drink the water. Oh, of course, they get divorced. She loses the ketuva. She loses, you know, whatever she's supposed to get from her husband. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. But this was a pretty much the procedure. They warned her. They encouraged her. They gave her musar. And she would say that she understands. And nevertheless, she denies the whole thing. And then they would warn her. This is what will happen to you. In fact, you did commit this. And then they tell her the entire curse, the entire kilala. You're going to basically die. And it's going to be a miserable death. And what would she answer? Amen. She would answer Amen to all the kilalot. What does the word Amen mean? El Melech Ne'eman. That he is, you can trust him. He's reliable. That he will repay those who do the mitzvot. He will reward them. And he will punish those who rebel against him. Now, was Ne'eman, I trust and I believe that that is what he will do. So, this entire procedure is a very, very psychological and emotionally charged uh, time uh, when a woman is facing the Kohen Gadol and seeing what she's about to, to go through. And hopefully she's smart, and she, she committed it, of course, and she admits beforehand. The Midrash tells us there was once a smart aleph. If we can use that word for a woman, too? Yeah. Is it smart aleph for women, too? Yeah. And she did it. You know, she committed the Navon. But she had a twin sister. So she sent her sister to go to Jerusalem. Let her drink the water, and she didn't do anything. Nobody would know the difference. Huh? What do you think about? Huh? So her sister drank and nothing happened to her, of course. So she goes back home. The two sisters meet. And they're so excited and so happy for each other. They embrace and they kiss. And as soon as they kiss, the water that the other sister drank, the, something of the water entered the woman. And she died on the spot. She thought she could get away with it. No way in the world. <laughs> That's all right. What? Yeah. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. What happens if this woman was, in fact, not an honest woman? She betrayed her husband. But this man was never a good man either. He would also cheat on his wife. Then the water would not work. Then the water would not work. Even if she, even if she did. Okay. If the man was also no good, he's no better than your wife. Even though her punishment is much more severe than his, she's a married woman. A married woman cannot be married more than to one man at one time. A man, even though he, he he's supposed to live in sanctity with his wife, technically he's allowed to have more than one wife at one time. He can have four. Right. So what did he do? He committed an act of prostitution. What is prostitution? To live or to cohabit with a woman without the sanctity of Kupan Kiddushin, without being married to her. That's all. Without the chupa. No. No, he's allowed to. If you want to marry more than wife, ahlan wa sahlan, go ahead. But kupa and kiddushin. Right? Give her a ring, take her into your home, provide for her everything. Today, of course, they, 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 would, they would accuse you of bigamy. Right? Unless you live in Morocco, maybe, or in Teman, in Yemen, where they still allow it. But today you don't want it too much. <laughs> Who would want? Sometimes, right? Unless you're like you it. Out of Who would want to have two? I heard that you go out of town. Yeah. Then you're allowed to have. Uh, well, hardly yeah. yeah. anyone with one who wants you. Yeah. yeah. Party. Anyway, there was something called pilakshim at one time, concubines, which was something. It's a similar relationship. In any event, what the Torah does not allow after matanto, after the Torah was given, is znut. Znut is prostitution. A lack of kedusha in the relationship. The relationship between a man and a woman is holy. It is intended to procreate, and it's also intended for emotional stability. Of course, it, it, it bonds them. That's fine as long as it's long term. No short term liaison. What do they call it? Yeah. No short term. These kind of things. Yeah. There's another word for it, but it's okay. You understand what I mean? It has to be a long term relationship built and founded on kedusha. And, not, and this would be Znut. So if the man was a zone, as a nai, if he was also one who would cheat on his wife, so he broke the trust, then the waters would not work on her. Now, since, unfortunately, unfortunately, over the time, the generation uh, deteriorated, and amongst many Jews, there were many menafim, mena is adulterers, men, who cheated on their women over time, they discontinued them. Because they saw the waters would not work. So instead of being a Hilul Hashem, the water, they would never know. 
The water is not working. She must be okay. But the reason why it wasn't working is because the man is as bad. So they said, you know what? The men are so bad. There's so many men cheating at that time. Oh, this is over time, over many years, or during a specific generation. They said, you know what? Let's discontinue this. It's not going to work. You know, where's where are you going to see the sign of, from heaven that this is that this is you know an avona? You're not going to see it because the man is just as guilty. So they discontinued it. But that does not mean that the woman gets away with it. A woman who's an eshet ish who can only be married to one man at a time, as opposed to a man who's also committing an avon, but it's not the same. An eshet ish, a married woman who goes with another man, whether he's single or married, is a terrible sin. And if she commits the sin, then don't be surprised if something else happens to her during her lifetime. Because even though there may not be the similar experience of sota today, where she goes in front of a kohen and, and, and he pours the gives her the water to drink, but Yesh din ve yesh dayan. Just like the Gemara tells us, Afal pi, she arba mitot betin batlu, even though we don't have today the four types of death penalties that can be uh, prescribed by the Sanhedrin, because we don't have a Sanhedrin, right? We don't have a Bet Hamidash. And they would they would uh, give the death penalty in rare situations where it was warranted. Even though we don't have that ability today, we don't have the jurisdiction to carry out the death penalty. Nevertheless, even though arba mitot betin batla, din, the din of, me, of the mitot was not batel. If somebody was supposed to get chenek, which was a form of choking, he would drown instead. Somehow he would, he would drown. If he was supposed to get sekila, which was being thrown off a second-story building, and, or stoned, he's not actually stoned with any stone, he, you know, he basically, you know, his bones are broken, or his skull is fractured, through the falling over from a second-story building. That we don't have today. If somebody deserves sekila, he gets into a car accident and gets killed. Okay, through a car accident. Or has a shalom something else. He falls off a cliff. He was hiking and somehow he slipped. Well, there's not such a thing as somehow. He was in a shamayim. That's sekila. Hereg, which would have been uh, removing one's head, would come about by being shot. Serefa, which would be the burning of the intestines. All of these were quick deaths, by the way. Not tortured deaths. They were meant to be quick. Uh, the burning of the intestines through hot lead. Somebody is burned in the fire. And there are all types of other types of... Uh, this is in uh, Olam Azeh. Yeah. And obviously the intent of all of this is not cruel punishment. Hashem does not punish. That would be the wrong word to use. But it's a, it's a way for him to receive his kapara, his atonement for what he did in this world where he's better off than receiving it in the world to come. So whatever suffering one goes through in this world, a woman who committed a terrible avon while she's in Eshet Ish of being with another man somehow she will end up paying for it. It's a very serious avon. And there are all sorts of diseases today. And diseases don't happen for no reason too. It's also a form of atonement, form of kapara. Okay, now, what would happen if the woman in fact did not stay? If she went through the process, through the procedure of drinking the water, the water examined her, she was clean. She went through, she just went through <coughs> hell, right? She, she was embarrassed in public, right with the shame. A lot of people saw that this is a public thing. Yeah, this is public. In order to, this was also known. We we're, we're trying to discourage her. We're right. We're trying to convince her. Admit, don't go through this. Let's not have this spectacle. Right? Is that the right word? Right? This whole thing, this whole scene. Right. So, this was hopefully intended that everybody's going to see her. She would want to admit. If she didn't, of course, this is what would happen. What? So, what happens if she did not do anything? So the pasuk says. Let's go back to the first one. I want to read the Hebrew one. After she drinks the water, she became impure. She was unclean. She betrayed her husband. The cursed water, the bitter water, will enter her. Her stomach would swell and her leg would fall. She will be as a curse in amongst her people. In other words, she would die. Being known it now, but if she was not unclean, if nothing ever happened. Aisha, uh, the woman who never became unclean, with the she's clean. The niketa, the waters will cleanse her, cleanse her reputation too. When it's Razan, she will have children. In other words, she will be blessed, and boys, and an easy birth. In other words, all of this is midah keneged midah. You know, there is such a rule, midah keneged midah, an eye for an eye, measure for measure. What is the measure for measure here? The punishment happens in what area of the body? The stomach area. Because that is the area where she sinned, the uterus, right? That is the area, the stomach. 
where the sin was committed, that is the area that is swelled first. That same area that she was suspected of committing a sin, if she did not sin, that area will be blessed. Instead of becoming swollen with bitter water, it becomes swollen in pregnancy. See? So this is a blessing instead of a curse. No, but the man no, no. He didn't say what he said. 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 He didn't say what he so anyway, so the Torah is letting us know that don't worry, this is not for nothing. If you were suspected of nothing, you will be blessed. This will come out as a blessing. And of course, the biggest blessing of all is that this makes peace with husband and wife. He can rest assured that his wife was what he always thought. I hope he thought. A good, righteous woman. A modest woman. Then they get divorced. Divorced. Then they get divorced. Then you get divorced. Obviously, this is what's intended over here, that she sees all the pressure that she should do to Shiva, she should admit, and she was smart, that's what she would do. Yeah. But some women, or some men too, even when they see that they're facing death, right? Yeah. Even at the entrance of Gehenom, they don't do the Shiva. That's a terrible, yeah. terrible situation. Okay, the next point is that the Torah tells us, after the Pashat Sota, there's something called Nazir. And that's right. What's the connection between the Nazarite and Sota? A Nazarite means he hold, holds himself back from drinking wine, from shaving his beard, from growing it, from cutting his hair. The rabbi tells whoever sees the Sota, the Kilkula, whoever sees the Sota going through what she's going through, the Kilkula meaning that she is a woman who, who, who is Kalkila. In other words, she uh, lost her modesty, she lost her kavod, her honor, her dignity. Whoever sees a woman going through this situation, Yadir Tzomina Yain. In other words, should hold himself back from wine. Why? Because wine, especially if you overdo it, could also lead to trouble. Right? The person becomes high. We're not talking about drunk and driving right now. We're talking about committing acts that later on you regret. Right? Yeah, wine. So the rabbis tell us, you know what the connection between the two is? If one who sees it, so far, going through what goes through, let him watch himself. Let him be more cautious with those things, not necessarily just wine. Anything that could lead to this. A person goes to a, a, to a bad movie. He has his TV at home and he watches all the dirty shows. What's his mind? He's infecting and infesting his mind with all these ideas. Kids see all the crime and violence. So they are also affected by this. A person who sees these situations, he should learn from them and de- take whatever co- uh, steps he needs to avoid that it should happen to him and happen to his children. He has the answer to should hold himself back from wine as an example. That wine could lead to this drink, you have a jolly time, and it is time, and you know, let's go out and let's have a drink together, etc., etc., etc. Now, the Torah is not telling us that you should be a completely, uh, I always forget the word in English, uh, aesthetic. You know what that means? You do not enjoy any of the pleasures of the world. Like the, like, yeah, like the yeah, monkey. Yeah. Right? No, no, not you, that's something else. I think I, I, think I pronounced it okay, right? Yeah. No, oh, no, no, that's a different word. No, aesthetic no, is a different word. That has to do with cleanliness. The word aesthetic. is aesthetic. Aestheticism, right? The Torah does not promote this idea. The Torah wants us to have children and not like the priests yeah. who never marry and do other things. Sure. Right? The Torah wants us to enjoy life in everything that your eyes can see. Control it, of course. But make a blessing before you eat it. Make a blessing after you put it in your mouth. Know where it comes from and who gave it to you. Appreciate it. On the contrary, the rabbis tell us that person when he reaches upstairs, they will ask him, why didn't you Try, you know, the food, all the good food in this world that I created. I, did, I made it for you. I created it for you. Why did you hold yourself back? So God does not want us to fast and to hold ourselves back from pleasure. As long as we control ourselves and we do it with the right measure, it's okay. Anything which is too much is no good. But all the things that are nice in life and that are permissible, go ahead and enjoy them. Wine, don't hold yourself back unless your ultimate goal is a good reason. And as he had a good goal, and as he wanted to sanctify himself for a period of time, he wanted to set people going on a diet. This is a spiritual diet. Nazir is a spiritual diet. It leads to, hopefully, if that's what it's intent is, to lead uh, to a spiritual goal. It's that he controls himself, he holds himself back, and after that, perhaps, he will have the strength to begin to do 
what, 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 what he had a hard time doing. So he's preventing himself, he's holding himself back from his wine from, or from other tavot, other desires, so that he can muster the strength to to grow spiritually. So that's permissible. So the, the connection between Sotan and Yezirut is that one who sees that families are breaking up, he sees people getting into trouble, to closely observe this, these, these cases and learn from them so that it should not repeat itself in his home. Because when people's homes break up, obviously, if you investigate, you will find that some of the components or some of what the factors that led to this breaking up may exist in your home too. Husband yells or curses his wife, the kids see and hear this. You know, these things can happen. Regardless of whether you had a bad day and that's why you're cursing, it makes no difference. You have, a person has to control himself. There has to be kavod at home. Right? Husband comes home after a long day, doesn't speak to his wife, sits down, reads the paper, eats the food, goes to the internet, goes to sleep. What happens to the communication? It's going to break up. So a lot of people do a lot of things wrong, and then it's too late to fix it. Nazir is close to Sotah because Haroe Sotah Kula, you're seeing problems next door. Learn from that. So it does not happen to your home. The next area is Right? This is the blessing that the priests bless the rest of the Jewish nation. Right? And we have this blessing also now, nowadays, when the Kohanim bless the rest of the congregation. This is a very interesting blessing. The Natan ben Uziel says as follows. What does it mean, Yevarech Hashem Vishmarech? God should bless you and should protect you. Because if you get a blessing, what's a blessing? You won the lottery, you won a million dollars. But a day later, somebody holds you up and takes all the money away from you. Was that a blessing? Good. A real blessing is that it stays with you. It sticks with you. You get a blessing, you're blessed with money, and the money remains with you. Yevarech Hashem, He should bless you, but the Yishmerecha, Mina Mazekim, Mina Listim. He should protect you from the thief. He should protect you from losses. He should protect you from expensive doctor bills. Right? But today I went to see how much a small little part of my car is. A very small little part. It's plastic. They wanted forty six dollars for it. It's the it's the louver that lets the air condition out. You know that little Yeah, you know yeah, little yeah, thing for the clients are one forty six dollars. So that's called highway robbery. For sure. But you know. But that I'm lucky. I don't have to replace it. It works perfectly fine. Yeah. Sometimes you have no choice. It's a major part of the car. The car will not work with it. Then what do you do? Yeah. Well, if you're lucky, go to the junk shop. And you find it. Yeah. Right? You, you, these are expenses. If Hashem protects you, He's going to protect you from having all of these extra expenses and losses. Okay. That's the idea of Yishmerecha, to protect you. Ya'er Hashem panav elecha v'choneka. Ya'er Hashem panav elecha means that He will brighten or enlighten your face. What does that mean, enlighten you? In various commentaries, one says that he will reveal to you secrets of the Torah. When one learns the Torah, he can discover many secrets. Hashem will help him learn the Torah and discover a lot of secrets of the Torah. Isa Hashem panav elecha Hashem will accept or listen to your prayers. V'yasem lecha shalom And he will make sure that you have peace everywhere. That's a very powerful blessing. Yesem Lecha Shalom means that you will have no trouble with your kids, you will have no trouble at home with your Shalom Bayit, you will have no trouble with your neighbors, with your work, uh, in your wor- at work. One needs to have Shalom everywhere. A person may, may not have a very good neighbor. There's a special prayer that we say every morning, Shashem Yatsileno, Mishachen Ra. Right, Isaac? Yeah. Some people, you know, have bad neighbors and you, you're stuck with them maybe for many years. Right? So you need a blessing in all of these areas. The question is, why didn't the Kohanim make it simple? Yivarechem Hashem, Mishmorochem. In other words, why all these details, these blessings? Ya'er Hashem, Yisa Hashem, Yisem Hashem, why so much? So there's a beautiful mashal. That's brought down, Yechafet Chaim mentions this. No, not Yechafet Chaim. Where there was once a very rich man who had a very big field, a lot of produce, wheat, fruit, vegetables. And a poor man once arrived at the field. The poor man said, you know, you give me a little bit of what you have. Because I'll gladly give you. I have pity on you. Bring me all the bags you have, and I'll fill them up. And the poor man takes out this one little bag. 
a rich man looks at him and says, I wanted to give you tons of food that should last you for an entire year. And you bring a little bag. Go to town, and if you have to borrow as many bags as you want, as you can, bring it because I promise I will fill you all the bags that you bring to me. Huh? Good man, huh? Hashem says, I have so much to offer you, so much to give you, so much beracha. But I want you to fulfill the mitzvot, the mitzvot and the Torah that you do are the bags. In order for a person, for a Jew, to receive blessings, he has to have a keli, a vessel, to receive it. One has to do something. It's like, imagine somebody coming to the tzaddik, to be the righteous. Can you bless me that I should have good panasah, children? The tzaddik knows this and he's not religious. He doesn't keep Shabbat. His wife doesn't go to the mikvah. How could the tzaddik bless him? There's no keli. One has to do something. One has to create a vessel, bring a bag, for Hashem to pour in the berachot. If you don't bring bags, if you don't make a keli, where is the blessing going to get into? It's not going to come up. It's not going to come. It's not going to fulfill itself, the blessing of the tzaddik. It's worthless. And not the No. no the, 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 right. The individual has to be convinced that he has to do something. Hashem says, you want me to do something for you? You do something for me. That is all these blessings that we, we see that the Kohanim are telling us. These are the blessings Hashem wants to give us, but we have to come with the Torah, so we have to come with the bank. We have to prepare Kelly to absorb all these blessings. Now, there's something else with this blessing, which is very interesting. A blessing, the Quran are telling us, comes from Hashem. It does not come from your PhD from 12 years going to law school or post school and everything. It comes from Hashem. How do we know that? Because the Pasuk in the Shlei says, Mirkat Hashem, hi ta'ashir. Veloyosit aitzedima. There's two conditions on how you recognize. There are various ways you can recognize the blessing is from Hashem. Maybe the man inherited the money from his father. That's not necessarily a blessing. His dad left him millions of dollars. Birkat Hashem, the blessing is from Hashem. Lo yosit aitzedima. There will be no pain that will come along with it. You will be easy. In other words, you will not lose it. That's number one. And you will not be distraught from it. You will not, you will not destroy your life. A lot of people who earned a lot of money, their lives were destroyed as a result of that. They went into, they got into trouble, uh, into all sorts of problems. The true bracha Hashem stays with you, stays with several generations, with your children. The Lord is the in mind, there's no pain or sorrow along with it. It's clean. What this tells us is therefore, that if a person earns his money through illegal, not kosher means, it will not stay with them. And there may be a lot of etzif, a lot of sorrow, and a lot of problems. As the Pasuk in Yirmiyahu says, Oseh Osher velo mishpat, a person who earns his wealth, but it was lo mishpat, it was illegal, b'chatsi yamav ya'azveno, u'b'charito yenaval. It will leave him somewhere during the middle of his life. Not necessarily within two, three months. He would leave him somewhere in the Amav. and his end will be Naval. Naval means that he will be scorned, he's considered a scoundrel. People will eventually find out how he earned his money. So the rabbis explain what does this mean? Any money that was earned in non kosher ways, you know, a lot of people, for example, cheat insurance companies, that's a typical example of non kosher. Right? That money has no blessing, just like the money that he earned on Shabbat. And therefore, that money will leave him at some point in his life. Either the money will leave him, or he will leave his money. And I can tell the story that happened with my grandfather in South Africa. This story happened, I don't know, maybe 60 years ago or so, maybe a little less. My grandfather was visiting in South Africa, helping in Shiva, and there was also in South Africa at the time the <coughs> Rabbi of Ponovich. The Rosh Hashiva, who was also collecting funds for his Shiva. And the Rabbi of Panavish told my grandfather a story that just happened to him. He had just met the South African Jew. He came over to him and he always had a question. He doesn't understand why every day when he says the Amidah, the prayer, Rabbi Koshmanes, we say, Mashpil Geim Adeharik, that God is able to bring a person down from the greatest height very quickly to the lowest depth. He says, Rabbi, I have all my investments diversified. I have investments in Switzerland. I have money in Manhattan, I have a lot of real estate in South Africa. You mean to say that God can take all of that away in one time, in one day? I mean, it's all over the place. What could happen? If something goes wrong here, I still have the money there. 
He means that everything at one time. So the rabbi turns to him, sir, you don't understand. Shem does not have to take the money through. He can take you away from the money. And the rabbi goes on and tells my grandfather, you know what? It's very interesting. I just heard two days ago this man passed away. In other words, I don't know, of course, if the rabbi, I don't know, the words somehow affected his mazal, but obviously it's not a coincidence, and it could be there was a big accusation against this man uh, as a result of suspecting what I mean. It takes foolishness. That's also a ruach stud. Now, how would you think that way? Think straight. The money doesn't have to go. You can go, and you will not be able to enjoy or to benefit the money. That is what Yirmiyahu says. Bahasi amavi azveno. Halfway through his life, either he will leave his money, or the money will leave him. In other words, one of the two is going to happen. I think that's pretty much it for Barshat Naso. Did you pull up that anything here? One second, would you pull up that anything here? Yeah. Yeah, let's just cover one more point. Yeah, we have time for one more point. What, is that? what was the, the question? The question was that the, 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 the woman is fine. The woman is good. And yeah. The husband is bad. Why is the husband? Everybody at some point receives, but the man, the man will only receive something if his wife wants. No, no, the wife is doing something. He's talking about the water. No, no, he's talking. No, he's talking about a situation where the wife is good, but the man does something yeah. bad. The man is the wife. Then there's there's no necessarily punishment in Olam. It could be no Olam Abba. Now, if the man is a good man, and Hashem wants him to get his kapara in this world, then he will send him an atonement in this world to clean him up. Some people did things wrong when they were young. So Hashem sometimes is concerned about this man. This man is a good man. But he, he, he fell into a trap. Why? His business was in the Far East. And he was away from his wife for many months. No, no, no. Right? No, no. Whether married or not. Okay, he's single. Regardless, he did something that was not right. Hashem is concerned about that. Hashem wants the person to have a clean record as soon as possible. So sometimes he sends him the kapara in this world. So he has a clean record when he gets up there. So it can happen. But as I said in the beginning before you came, ordinarily there's no sakhar of you know, no? No reward and punishment. But Hashem, the Hazlag Adol, in all His mercy, wants to atone, wants to help us atone. That's what Yom Kippur helps us with. Yom Kippur doesn't help for everything, but it helps us all a great deal. On condition that the individual does the Shuvah. So, therefore, Balei Teshuvah, many times, immediately after they do real Teshuvah, they have trouble. Mental trouble. Because Hashem says, You're for real? I want to help you. They think, Where is Hashem? <laughs> Hashem is helping you because He wants to clean you up. And that is why he's sending you all these troubles. Let's, let's just cover one more point, which had to do also with Sita. The, we talk about the fact that one who sees troubles happening to others should be cautious, because it can happen to him too. There's a mashal of an individual who once applied for a job. Today we have taxi drivers. In those days they had taxi drivers. They were also cab drivers, right? So he came for an interview. So the, this group of interviewers wanted to make fun of this guy. You know, they wanted to have a good time with him. So they asked him a tough question. What do you do if you're driving your wagon and the wheels get stuck in mud? So he says, what do you mean? If they get stuck in mud, I go down and I push. What if it's in heavy mud and all the pushing doesn't help? Then I get a big board, piece of wood, and I stick it underneath you know, the, the wheel and I somehow managed to push it up. What if that doesn't help? I get another horse. What if that doesn't help? Now he's back in the He says, what would you do? <laughs> so they all start laughing at him. He's silly. He says, we would make sure we don't get into the mud to begin with. <laughs> That's the difference between a hacham and a pikeach. Hacham knows how to get out of trouble. A pikeach, a one who's smart, makes sure he doesn't get into the trouble to begin with. Obviously, they were teaching him a lesson that as a driver, the most important thing to do is make sure you don't have to get into trouble. That is a, one of the most important messages here with Nazir or with Sota in general. That the best, the best thing is to make sure you don't get into trouble. Because once you're in the trouble, once you have to fight the Yeser, your chances of, of winning are very slim. The Yeser is very powerful, the evil thing. Very powerful. So don't put yourself into that situation where you have to, you have to fight him. Now it's difficult. What do I do? Nobody sees me. You think nobody sees me. Hashem sees knows everything that's going on. Everything is recorded. Everything is written down. Right? You think. for You have a rough stood for a moment. Don't put yourself in that situation. Right? And, and it will not happen. Hopefully it will not happen. So a Jew who learns Torah on a regular basis makes sure he does not allow his eyes to wander too far. His home is clean from any garbage. 
he has a better chance of having a peaceful life, a stable home, a good marriage, and good healthy children. One who starts meddling with all these things that are in the street and brings it into his house, where are the fences? You brought it into your house, it's enough it's outside. You want to bring it into your house, you bring that TV box into your house, right? You bring the videos into your house. You bring the dirty magazines. You bring it into your house and you expect to be able to fight it? You're not going to be able to fight it. It's going to be too powerful, right? And people do all sorts of things today. They access internet sites that are terrible. They're bringing it into their home. It used to be far away. You'd have to go to play, to, to some faraway place to see these things. Today people are bringing it into their home. And that's very, that's a big problem because they're destroying their home. So the most important lesson of Sota is Nazira. Stay away. Don't get too close. That is the best way to protect yourself in your dad.